Next, um, as I said, we are going to have Girish Krishnan speak and welcome. Uh, thank you uh, for the organizers for inviting me here. Um, so uh, I'm uh, Girish Krishnan, so I'm actually a nuts and bolts engineer. Uh, so you would be wondering what I'm doing here, uh, but uh, I like to work on robots. I like to work on new technologies. Uh, I like to think of myself as uh, someone who creates new technology, uh, creates new design methodologies for technologies, et cetera. But um, I think we uh, heard a little bit from the previous talk as, as well. All that really means nothing if we do not engage with the right people, if we do not evaluate it in the field. And uh, that's why I partner with uh, uh, Professor Wendy Rogers here. Uh, and uh, we have some clinical partners from OSF Healthcare as well. Uh, so. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a project that we just began a couple of years ago. In fact, um, uh, it, it was actually later than that, uh, just when the pandemic hit, um, the two of our groups actually met, we exchanged some ideas and uh, we brainstormed and something came out of it. And uh, we approached uh, uh, this uh, consortium, the OSF and Jump Simulation Consortium for uh, seed funding. And uh, we were uh, awarded a, uh, a small pot of money to explore some ideas in this space uh, of soft and dexterous robot configurations uh, to support older adult um, healthcare. So um, <clears throat> the motivation of this, uh, in fact, there is, uh, uh, I mean, I mean uh, there's no debate here. The COVID-19 pandemic kind of exposed some gaping holes in uh, uh, the healthcare system of not just the US, but also the world. Uh, around 9 million older adults um, who needed care for chronic and acute conditions uh, did not get the same quality of uh, pre-pandemic care that they usually are used to. Um, so a large percentage of them were even left stranded during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of hospitals uh, jumped in and then they tried um, uh, to uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, start this uh, telehealth uh, visits, telehealth mechanism uh, to, uh, to kind of fill this gap. Uh, and uh, I, I think if you talk to a lot of hospitals in and around this area, they'll tell you that it worked great, uh, but there was something missing, especially for, um, uh, for kind of care that required close proximity association with the patients. Um, uh, for example, uh, you see in the figure here, um, it's about a doctor uh, trying to uh, get some uh, acoustic signals, feel, as well as uh, communicate with the patient, um, and then uh, even some visual cues. So all these cannot be substituted with, uh, with just blind telehealth. So the real question here is, how can we create affordable solutions to scale this telehealth and also increase its quality or also increase its uh, realism uh, um, in some sense. Um, so uh, one possibility is that uh, we can use robots, uh, robots that actually are in the physical space with the patients, but are teleoperated or operated remotely by uh, the healthcare professionals uh, sitting uh, in their office, uh, right? So um, there has been a lot of efforts in this space and I'll, I'll uh, come to uh, uh, kind of what's happening in this space. But before that, uh, even like five to six years ago, there, there was a lot of uh, technologies that sprouted in this uh, space. Um, uh, so most of them I would classify as uh, iPad on wheels, basically just uh, uh, with, with the ability to go around uh, the space of the older adult uh, with the ability to um, engage with uh, uh, with them and uh, uh, and the healthcare professional basically um, having a, a nice chat with uh, uh, with the patients and uh, well there there were some uh, other solutions for example um, uh, I mean uh, I I did. Uh, did not have the reference here, but it was in my um, <clears throat> other set of slides. But 
uh, they also had um, uh, kind of tools like stethoscope, um, blood pressure cuffs, uh, et cetera, uh, within their uh, laptop on wheel setup. And then uh, even, uh, more so, not so much in the healthcare space, but in order to assist older adults with activities of daily living, um, uh, there are some new commercial products here. Um, I'm showing Labrador systems. Um, uh, this is uh, one product, I think, which uh, Professor Roger, Rogers also uh, interacts with. Uh, so these are products that can go around your house. Uh, it can collect, active, uh, collect um, items, uh, medication, et cetera, uh, for the older adult and follow the older adult to wherever they are and deliver it. So uh, that there are a lot of such technologies uh, that uh, that have propped up. Um, but most of these do not have the ability to manipulate. And uh, the, the technologies that can manipulate are still, I would say, in the research phase. So here is a very uh, prominent nursing robot. It's known as Adaptive Robotic Nursing Assistant uh, from, um, I think, University of uh, Louisiana or Louisiana State University, I think. Um, but basically, it is everything with a robot arm or a manipulator. Um, and uh, Professor Rogers also has uh, worked with uh, Charlie Kemp, who, was, who I understand was also involved in TechSage uh, several years ago. And uh, they have actually together investigated the ability of a commercial robot um, to um, assist older adults with activities of daily living, like feeding, uh, combing their hair, um, ability to, uh, or to dress them, etc. cetera. And um, in, in another extreme space, there are robots that can actually help uh, lift patients. So uh, this is uh, another form of nursing assistant um, and uh, uh, I mean, the, this is a prototype uh, from Japan, from an institute in Japan, which is able to do it. But there, is, there are some barriers for adoption for all these technologies in the field. And uh, we need to ask some of the key questions. So are they functional? Are they really safe? Can we trust them all by themselves? Are they easy to control, right? And um, in some sense, None of what you see here kind of matches uh, the efficacy of, of this part of uh, um, uh, a human doctor in close proximity with uh, the patient. Okay. So uh, we have a uh, hypothesis and our hypothesis is that soft robots made of stretchable skins, uh, tendons, fibers, fluids with no rigid parts actually can provide that missing or can fill that missing gap, uh, can uh, basically translate what you saw in all these technologies to a more personal, um, humane uh, way of uh, treating patients. And um, uh, here is uh, one example. Uh, this is uh, my colleague's lab at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, where uh, quite a decade ago, actually, they tried uh, these inflatable links that work with uh, patients, uh, work with uh, older adults as well. With, and they can help feed, they can help clean, uh, etc. They are completely inflatable in the sense that um, they are safe. They do not uh, transmit any impact energy upon collision, they absorb it. And uh, so this way they, uh, they give you a sense, a perception of safety as well. Now, a few uh, Disney Hollywood producers, uh, they toured his lab and then they created this movie as you know, the uh, Baymax, the big hero six. So actually this was the first, I would say Disney movie, which was uh, inspired by a prototype in a lab. Um, so, uh, so these are soft robots. So you see they, there, are, there are no rigid links. There are no um, heavy metals or um, heavy links, actuators, sensors, et cetera. Another um, uh, kind of type of soft robot is what you see in the extreme um, right here, which is uh, known as a continuum robot inspired by octopus tentacles and uh, elephant trunks 
etc so they curl around obstacles they have amazing dexterity and with dexterity brings functionality so uh, if, if you look at soft robots yes they are as functional as uh, the rigid ones are they safe probably they are they they are safe because of the inherent uh, structure inherent uh, feel inherent uh, make of uh, uh, constituents that go into uh, creating these robots. Now, the real question that we would like to ask is, can we trust them? Do they elicit some kind of trust with older adults? And are they easy to control? So this is again an engineering question, which uh, I, in uh, my perspective has not gained a lot of attention. And this is where I think there's a lot of focus uh, to ensure that they, are, they can be easily controlled and monitored by uh, uh, different individuals. So, <clears throat> um, so if for the rest of the talk, I'll be, I will show some um, initial results or preliminary results on how uh, some of these uh, soft robots, the, the ones that we have built in our labs, uh, our prototypes um, can, um, or what kind of framework we use um, to answer some of these questions trust as well as controls. So um, the approach that that kind of we use uh, to innovate in this space uh, into um, uh, to kind of create knowledge is to involve all the different stakeholders in the process. And the different stakeholders are the older adults who the robot, I mean, uh, the robot acts, um, uh, is interacts with these older adults, is in the proximity of older adults, as well as healthcare professionals who actually control um, these robots. Uh, there could also be family um, uh, caregivers, uh, there could also be other uh, stakeholders involved, uh, but uh, uh, for now we uh, kind of limit ourselves to older adults and the healthcare professionals uh, themselves. Um, and then there is the control aspect. So here is the trust aspect uh, from the older adults as well as the uh, healthcare professionals, the trust and the functionality aspect. And then there is um, the control aspect, which um, it should be easy for both the older adult as well as the healthcare professional to control it. Uh, and then we need to co-design this robot, um, basically design them uh, with all of these aspects kind of included. And for this, we need um, um, a, a kind of station, we need a home where uh, all these aspects come together. And we are lucky to uh, be doing this in the McKechnie family uh, life home where, um, uh, where we are currently stationed uh, to conduct our research. So um, let's begin with this robot design. So we have to start somewhere. Uh, so uh, to get this process rolling, uh, so we started with a seed design, which is um, a manipulator, uh, which is a continuum manipulator. Uh, so remember, I. All right. OK, so the robot, I mean, the video is playing. So you see it's a continuum manipulator like uh, an octopus arm that can uh, bend and curl around obstacles. Uh, so it's able to do pick and place, it's able to avoid obstacles, as well as it's able to um, curl around like a snake, spiral or twirl, and, uh, and it's able to maintain contact with an object. And all this it does in a very safe, very interactive manner uh, without uh, damaging uh, any of the objects, both uh, in the environment as well as the humans. But right here, there is a fundamental trade-off, that of functionality and adaptability. So if we'd like this to be adaptable, safe, dexterous, and go around obstacles, uh, while at the same time, we would like this to carry heavy loads, carry all the sensors that are required to monitor humans, uh, monitor older adults. Um, and um, so there comes this trade-off, which um, I'll talk about, which, which is going to be the primary focus of our future uh, design. Um, so I think part of it got uh, compressed here. So uh, the next uh, aspect of our research is to evaluate this particular robot in um, in, in the um, in an actual realistic setting. So oh, that's okay. Sure. Thank you. 
All right, thank you. Looks much better. So um, for this, uh, what we did was uh, we designed a robot. Uh, yeah. So we designed a robot here. So as you see, the robot is actually a combination of a couple of rigid links. And at the distal end, we have um, the soft manipulator that emanates out, that, that kind of extrudes out of it and um, is able to uh, go in close proximity with the patients. So we created a video montage of, um, uh, of three different scenarios. One is the ability of the soft robot to monitor wounds. Um, so no price for guessing who's lying on that uh, bed there. Um, and um, uh, you see that I have a fake wound uh, on my uh, arm. And uh, the robot is uh, trying its best to position itself so that it's very close to the fake wound, um, ability to zoom um, the image and uh, provide that to the healthcare professional. The second uh, task that we created was um, to use a stethoscope and defector and uh, able to provide some auscultation or provide um, the, uh, the acoustic uh, feedback or signal uh, to the healthcare professionals uh, using this. And the third one, um, and I think, uh, well, I had one more as well, but the third one was the ability to uh, pinch the skin slightly to uh, judge for or, or to, uh, uh, to understand the dehydration um, levels in, uh, in the patient. So uh, these were the three uh, kind of tasks and there are many more in terms of scanning the body in terms of uh, you know, going across obstacles to, uh, uh, to uh, pick medication bottles. So all these were showed uh, to both older adults as well as healthcare providers. And uh, the healthcare providers, we basically asked them questions on um, the use case responses, um, what they kind of envision in terms of where this robot could be used, um, what are the different defectors that they would like, what the different scenarios which they think that this could be useful. And um, we learned quite a bit with the eight healthcare um, providers that we interviewed. And it turned out that healthcare providers did want a lot of sensors in it, like uh, sensing uh, blood oxygen levels, um, the ability, I mean, they, they, most of them, uh, it was surprising that they wanted, wanted the acoustic signal. So they wanted the ability to hear some of the um, uh, some of the sounds, the breathing, um, and uh, some other aspects of uh, um, of the patients as well. Uh, some of them also wanted um, this to uh, 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 to swab the patients, um, maybe uh, which is relevant for uh, COVID and uh, some other issues. So uh, apart from that. Um, dressing patients' wounds or lifting up the dressing to uh, closely monitor the wound. So these were some things that we learned from healthcare providers uh, that they would uh, like this robot to do. Uh, in terms of older adults, we are still processing uh, the, some of the information from their interviews, but it actually, uh, uh, most older adults seem like they have a good idea of what the robot should look. Some of them like this organic look, some of them want this. Uh, once uh, they, they want the robot to look more, um, more like a robot, uh, without the soft or without the creepy snake-like behavior. Um, so, uh, that, so that there could be uh, varied uh, responses there. But most of the healthcare providers they were very positive about um, this uh, particular uh, setup, and uh, they also um, were quite concerned about uh, the security lapses and in such a system. Um, so especially um, if, if the information um, that, uh, that they're giving out, uh, is it going to be secure um, and uh, et cetera. So some of those concerns came out. Um, okay, the third aspect is the controls. And uh, we want this robot to be controlled very organically by the healthcare providers. And so uh, assuming that uh, they do not need to know even Robotics 101, uh, they do not know, uh, need to know any fundamentals of programming, 
um, and they should be able to just use some kind of an iPad screen or tablet and uh, control this. So for this, uh, we uh, embarked on a specified, uh, a specific uh, control scheme known as visual servoing. We basically have three cameras placed on the system. So one of them could be on the ceiling, uh, it could be stationary or it could be near the bed, bedside of uh, the older adult. The other one could be on the rigid robot. And the third camera is at the end of the soft appendage uh, at the distal end. And uh, so uh, basically the older adult, uh, I mean, the, the healthcare professional would be seeing video footages from all these three cameras simultaneously. And in any of the screen, what the, uh, uh, they could just program a path, draw a line on the screen, like you see here. And uh, the robot tip should be able to follow that particular line. So this is a demonstration by one of my uh, PhD students, uh, but it's not uh, yet in um, the, the robot that we built. It's, so it's a standalone system there, but you can see, uh, get the idea of how um, it's able to do it. And even if uh, let's say the older adult obstructs, um, it still uh, jumps around a little bit, but then uh, it goes back to its trajectory. Um, the other thing that they could do is uh, just point on different targets in uh, the image. So the red dot, I mean, the green dot that you see here, the solid green is um, the target that's pointed by um, the healthcare professional and the robot moves so that uh, that image is at the center of the screen. So there's a lot of um, um, uh, camera based visual servoing math that goes into this um, whole setup. But the basic idea is that we need to get it uh, stable and uh, we need to ensure that uh, uh, there is shared control between the healthcare professional, um, the robot's own autonomy, as well as the older adult. Um, so finally, the, there is uh, one more video uh, here, and this is about hybrid visual servoing. So I, I uh, talked about three different camera views. Sometimes a target may be apparent only on one of the in one of the cameras, but um, uh, if the healthcare professional clicks on one of the target, but it's not seen by the end camera, then the end camera is able to uh, actually go in and track that uh, particular target. So you see here the. A green target is not visible from the soft arm, but then um, it basically calculates a position, which is that purple dot there where it's supposed to go. And uh, when it goes to the purple dot, it is able to see the green target there. So this is what uh, we call as hybrid visual servoing, where we are taking all the images and data from the different cameras and uh, we are able to coordinate uh, the movement of the robot. So, um, so as I said, this is uh, still um, a developing project. So we are still in some of the initial stages of it. Um, and uh, we, we still have a lot, a long way to go before uh, we uh, kind of evaluate this particular prototype. First, uh, we need to integrate uh, a good interface for the robot itself, but we need to evaluate this prototype in, um, uh, in the older adult setting. Uh, so to summarize, I would say that soft robots have a great potential for you know, close proximity care. And uh, it is um, upon us to investigate uh, some of the um, uh, trust and uh, functionality aspects of it. Um, so we are uh, making some uh, positive uh, strands in terms of control. Um, and the most important part is that uh, we need to engage both the healthcare professionals, as well as the older adults um, in this process of design and control. And, um, and that's where um, I think we are going to be iterating uh, with the design uh, as well in that particular framework. Um, so in, in general, uh, the perception of older adults, generally they have positive attitudes uh, for this, uh, but we may need to revisit the robot structure or how it um, basically interacts with uh, the patients. And uh, that there is some concern about data security and privacy. Um, 
which uh, we need to uh, eliminate as well. So with this, um, I'd like to uh, thank all uh, the group, the evolving group um, that uh, has worked on this project, uh, specifically uh, Dr. Ryan Reach from OSF Healthcare, who is our clinical partner in this case, um, and uh, Sister Pieta from the Jump Simulation, um, our postdocs, Travis and Naveen, uh, who helped the initial part, uh, helped structure the initial part of the project, and then um, our graduate students uh, in here as well. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, so I think this wonderful, I'm sorry, my name is Hamill, Sandra Pino, Paul, I'm going to end this the interpreter, totally good for you. Yeah. Okay, so I am the president of the Dust Seniors of America, and of course I represent the Dust community. And I'm wondering about maybe telehealth and when I have, with my daughter, uh, who uses the love, I have to use a separate phone line to where I can use a video relay service because uh, the telehealth will not or cannot include the sign language interpreter. So I wasn't able to see the doctor. I'm wondering if you thought about including a interpreter into the telehealth platform so that people can communicate more effectively, deaf individuals especially, can communicate directly with someone in telehealth as opposed to having to utilize a third party and a third party. That, that's an amazing uh, perspective, amazing question. Um, just uh, a week ago, I read somewhere that uh, a high school student um, developed an app that can automate um, speech into sign language. So, I mean, I, I think that, uh, uh, well, of course, it, it needs to be tested for the more, it needs to be robust, um, and uh, it needs to be specific to the, to the, to the healthcare um, Kind of setting, uh, but but yes, uh, I, I think there is uh, some work going on there, and uh, pretty soon we should be able to see uh, such packages integrated in telehealth. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to end this the interpreter. Thank you. So I think the idea of, of having the soft uh, robot, the flexibility, the ability, the ability to move around obstacles, particularly for home health is awesome um, because unlike uh, institutional health care, the rooms are not, are, are variable. I mean, everyone's right. different. Right. So being able to accommodate the variances in the environment, I think is a really good idea. Thank you. Um, and you, you talk about their attitudes towards the robot, but what about the, you know, older adults' attitudes towards having the camera, the fixed environmental camera, as opposed to um, a camera that is only there when the robot is active on the robot? Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, did you look at their attitudes towards that? And... And with that, if they're not in their bedroom all the time, then you need cameras wherever they might be, which means having multiple cameras around the house, which then also becomes you know, somewhat of an issue. Right, right. So, uh, I mean, to answer the first part of your question, actually, we did uh, just commence or just finished um, interviewing around 10 older adults um, with Wendy's group in uh, the life homes. And uh, we are still reviewing some of those uh, uh, those material there. And yes, they are very concerned about, um, I mean, when I mentioned data security and privacy, uh, privacy aspect is, I, I think, paramount uh, for them. I mean, they, they're really concerned about 
uh, privacy and uh, if the camera is going to be on or off all the time. Um, and uh, uh, to answer the second part of the question, I think uh, we do require uh, at least just two sets of cameras and some of the cameras need not be like fixed to the ceiling or fixed to any um, fixed part of the room all the time. It could be uh, in the robot, but it could be in the rigid base of the robot um, and it could be on only during the telehealth uh, parts. Uh, so th this is uh, something that can be enforced, uh, but then uh, it's also about the trust. So most cameras uh, come in with some inbuilt lighting system. So you know, them, you know that the camera is on when there is a light, you know, there's a red uh, small light which is on. So uh, some of these I think can help create uh, more trust with, uh, with, with the older adults on uh, the use of camera and uh, to uh, basically uh, ensure that the camera is not all the time monitoring them and, uh, and it's only monitoring them with their, uh, yeah, with their knowledge. Certainly yeah. that you know, people are used to having cameras in laptops and, and right. uh, you know, where if you have uh, you know, Alexa devices with cameras, they, you know, they, people can get used to cameras in the devices, but I was more concerned about you know sort of the cameras that are fixed in the that environment, fixed. right? And from the uh, the standpoint, the logistics of having to go into the house to do that uh, is one thing, I guess, for the, for the robot. But I mean, that, that, that's an interesting question. So I think uh, we shouldn't be so much reliant on cameras that are fixed or in in uh, the house uh, or, or the ceiling, but rather uh, just the inbuilt cameras within the robot themselves. So that could be more flexible. It could be uh, more adaptive. And different. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Girish. Um, a couple, we, we have some more questions, but we're going to have to um, hold off until the end and we, because we do have time there and we, we're trying to stay um, a little bit on a track here. And also, I just want to remind everybody who is participating remotely that you do have to turn on the captioning, um, but it is available there. Let me just... One other quick note for the group, um, our microphone for in-person attendees was only picking up right around here. So if you have a question, we'll try to repeat it. Um, we're not really hearing beyond that. So um, we'll try to do a better job of that going forward. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Meryl Friedman, who, let's see if I can see her. There she is. Okay, and Meryl, you should have, um, access, you should have presenter rights. So if you want to go ahead and start sharing. Nope, it's not working. Okay. No, it's a, it probably does work. I just um, am the oddball here. I have no slides. Oh, I'm sorry. Do we have, let me. Oh, I And I'm really sorry that everybody there has to look at me on a really big screen. Um, I'd highly suggest everybody just grab their laptop and get a little square, it's much, much more tolerable. Um, but thank you again. I can uh, maybe even help us make up a few minutes here uh, if that would be helpful. But thank you again for the opportunity to be here and for Lena's um, ever patience in uh, having to track me down to get information. So I don't know how you do it, but thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk, I think, a little bit about inclusive policy and advocacy from a healthcare um, perspective. So I do represent Anthem, and we have been very focused um, over at least my 15 years, but of course, you know, it evolves and, and gets stronger. The focus gets more focused um, over time on uh, what inclusive policy really is and how we get to the point where we are creating inclusive and sustainable policy um, and what that actually even means. And it's iterative and it's evolving. So I am open to comments today. Please follow.
follow up with me afterwards since I know we're on limited time um, at this particular point. But it's really been fascinating to watch how we can change what policy looks like for people with disabilities and older adults. I know this is shocking when we actually include people with disabilities and older adults in the conversation. Um, and I think, you know, the ability to say that we don't make decisions for people and we look at policies um, from the lens of how we as people with disabilities um, and people who are aging and people who encounter disability or people who are aging with disability um, actually experience right the results of those policies so we don't have unintended consequences uh, by bringing people into the conversation and that's so I have a, a team of people who help do that. So it's a really strong commitment. And the other, um, my colleagues and others, um, other health insurance companies that you are probably familiar with as well, also spend a good bit of time um, talking with people with disabilities and older adults uh, to make sure they're informing the work that they do. Um, so thinking through unintended consequences is the way we go about advancing equity. And you don't have equity if people with disabilities aren't and you know um, part of the discussion and we don't um, attain equity in healthcare and reduce health disparities if we don't have people with disabilities and older adults involved in what healthcare looks like and how we get to those solutions. So I repeat that a lot only because it's super important to me and I think it's how we get to a better place and we do improve outcomes that way. And through this, um, we'll talk a little bit about ARPA, HCBS, SDOH. We'll go through lots of the acronym salad and soup that we all live in in healthcare. Um, and I will do it quickly. Um, but primarily being able to say is we start with uh, our national advisory board that we created in 2007. Um, it is convened uh, by Lex Frieden and myself. We have been doing this together now for 15 years. And it is comprised of 15 um, people with disabilities and older adults um, and family members. So that we, so that's where we start. We have this trusted group that we can ask lots of questions, you know, proprietary questions, confidential questions. People can look under the hood. What are we actually doing? And how are we actually um, freezing and messaging, whether it be public comments, policy recommendations. So it's a policy to practice and practice to policy. It's very bi-directional. Um, and I strongly believe, because I'm highly opinionated probably more than anything, that that is the way that we will be more successful is by looking at from both angles and then trying to kind of move that forward and push together, push forward together. Um, so we have that national advisory board that's a focus, but we don't create change unless we're talking, you know, to people in lots of different communities and areas. And if you've uh, watched sort of the evolution of managed care, Medicaid managed care, managed long-term services and supports, it is required that people have advisory boards in each of the states. But even then, you're talking about like we have 15 people on the national advisory board. You may have 10 or 15 people on a statewide advisory board. It's not enough because everybody's experience is unique. Everybody's support needs are going to be unique. There's some foundational um, alignment that we can all work to bring to scale, but we really have to be in every community, in people's homes, in chapter houses on reservations, in senior centers. We have to go everywhere. Um, to talk to people, diners, cafes, if there's coffee, it's probably the first place I'll go. Um, you know, and so that's how we get the diversity of information and input that we need. So then when we are making comments, public comments, recommendations to CMS, recommendations to states, we're doing it aligned with the people who are going to be accessing those healthcare services. So we're working with providers, diverse providers. We're working with community-based organizations, um, and a diverse range of community-based organizations and trying to build that capacity. One of the important things that we're trying to do today so that more people with disabilities and older adults have the um, primary opportunity to access their services and supports in communities by building capacity and community. Um, and so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the workforce crisis. Um, and then we work with what our health plans look like, you know, so how diverse um, 
our, our associates, how many people with disabilities do we have working? The best way to change healthcare so that it is inclusive of people with disabilities is to have people with disabilities working in healthcare. Um, and that's kind of the, the primary goal. It's, you know, I always tell people, you know, come infiltrate the healthcare system. If we want to move past having a very ableist and paternalist approach to healthcare, even if it's well-intentioned <laughs> and not intended to be ableist, it's going to be unless people with disabilities are working within healthcare. So we've even created, um, I did the first uh, sponsorship recently to uh, Longmore College to get people with disabilities um, access to scholarships so they can get to school, personal assistance services, room and board type stuff, um, accommodations, anything that people need so that they are not facing experience barriers to education to be able to further, um, to get more people with disabilities into the healthcare system um, and working there. So we have to keep finding ways that we can bring people um, into making decision-making positions within healthcare. Um, and healthcare is, it's broad. It doesn't all have to be in managed care. It can be in hospitals uh, as physicians. It can be clinical. It can be administrative. It could be uh, policy. So we want people in all aspects and that's how we push forth. And the more, the more we do that, the more inclusive and the more accessible um, healthcare will become uh, to people, which is the ultimate goal. Um, National advisory board, local advisory board, all of these conversations are designed to create actionable results. So we want to know, you know, if the print is too small on somebody's ID card, like that's an important thing to communicate. Then we say, great, we need to make larger print on ID cards. Most of, I mean, honestly, I don't understand half of the information I get from Anthem, <laughs> from EOBs and other information they send out. So information has to be accessible. It means it needs to be in plain language, easy read. We talk a lot about health literacy, but if we stay at the buzzword level of health literacy, we're not gonna to get to a point where we're making um, information truly accessible to people and for people. You know, and that other point in there and the two and the four is we have to get better in healthcare to be inclusive to where we're focusing on things that are really important to people and their healthcare, not just for them, so that there is that better ability to engage um, and that's, you know, it's a, it's a broad category of engagement for people, but I think that's just a really important point. We need to quit focusing just on what's important for people um, and kind of narrow in on what's important to them. And that's how we really get into learning more about people and being able to address those social drivers of health. Um, you know, in our space of working with people uh, with disabilities and older adults and communities, that's what home and community-based services has been about. So we had HCBS and we got the new acronym of SDOH. We also got money, which is really weird, but that is how it works. Um, and we're excited for that. We just don't want HCBS to be lost in a greater schema of SDOH. And so we're working really hard to make sure that that balance is in there. Um, and ARPA dollars are super helpful because part of having sustainable home and community-based services um, is having a workforce. And we know we're really struggling with that. We know the disparate impact um, that uh, COVID has had on people with disabilities and older adults, on people of color who are supporting people with disabilities and older adults, um, and trying to really impact uh, what the direct care workforce, the direct support professionals and health workers are experiencing. Um, and the ARPA dollars are great because they went you know, straight in, big money, boom, states got it you know, to push forth and really put, you know, money into telehealth, money into building the workforce. Um, but the thing is, it's sort of a one-time investment. So we have to pick up that baton and help to, you know, further get information out to people. It's almost, um, and I just did a presentation um, for the Medicaid aging and disability directors um, yesterday on this, but it's really trying to say like, we almost need a marketing campaign. We have to get information out to people. We have to, you know, get better at, you know, making sure people with disabilities can support people with disabilities, they, right? And this is a really good career for people. If we get into schools and we get into places where we are encouraging people early on to join the workforce of supporting people with disabilities and getting into, you know, community health worker roles and direct support roles so that we can build the workforce. Um, and yes, there's a wage issue and there's a value issue and there's an education and training issue, but we can do it 
if we put that value behind it and we make this a very valuable role for people to have and that there are career opportunities. And so we even have this one um, program that we're working on where we are really training people with IDD to be peer supporters of people with uh, disabilities and then they can actually further their education and get certified and actually get into direct support professional work. And the way we do that is we also then start to look at, okay, how do we help with transportation? You know, if that's the only barrier to somebody with a disability supporting somebody with a disability, that's something we should be able to address. And we need to look beyond, right? And so the difference then there is if we're looking at NEMT, non-emergency medical transportation under an S2H framework, right? The equity framework for HCBS is making sure that we have accessible transportation. And so we, that's why we have to keep digging down on those things. And that's where our inclusive policy and advocacy is a gateway to ensuring that we're constantly looking at if we're looking at housing and people are looking at permanent supportive housing and we're looking at affordable and accessible housing and attainable housing, we need to look at accessible housing. And so that's where we're trying to under, you know, put those um, underpinnings in there so that we are not losing sight of solving for maybe more people because we still have 61 million people with disabilities that need to be included right in the conversations and in the um, services that are being established. And I think I'm running out of time with like two minutes left, but somebody can always just speak up and stop me. Um, but I think those are really the key points to, to get in there that, you know, we begin to as we look at advancing equity, we include people with disabilities, we include people with, who identify as LGBTQI, we include people of color, it's everybody. We are intersectional. There are people um, clearly with um, uh, multiple historically marginalized um, identities um, and realizing you know, most of us are, as I say, very professionally, a mishmash um, of you know, different experiences and different identities. Um, and we need to address inclusivity from that perspective um, because there is no equity without disability. And I think, you know, lastly, just looking at how we include people with mental health disabilities, um, people with chronic conditions, people with rare disorders, right? If we are all working together and we work in force, um, we will be more successful in creating change um, in our advocacy, whether it be, you know, um, in DC or in states or in local communities. Um, okay, I see Elena coming up there. I will stop talking. Thank, but thank you. you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much, Meryl. So um, next we can have questions for Meryl and for any of the speakers. I might ask Yurish if you don't mind to come up um, with me so that everyone who is remote can hear. Um, and I know that we had one question for Girish. Sure. Oh, real quick, we need to repeat the question. So um, what type of light, what type of light are they using for the markers? Currently, we're not using any detectors, just the cameras behind the mics, for example. And uh, I am not sure, I mean, we have to go back and check what we heard, what we uh, understood from the healthcare professional interview. Um, if there is a need for a uh, different kind of lighting, I think that could be interesting as well, because we could just uh, retrofit it at the end of uh, the arm. Uh, if it could be uh, UV, I, I, I wouldn't imagine UV or IR. So how are you doing like your scanning for when you said like the doctor can pinpoint a marker yes. and that can right so yeah we need to repeat sure. it um so sorry i can you can you repeat uh, it, i can uh, repeat so the question was um uh how would the doctor uh, kind of uh, identify a mark in uh, the patient's body uh, right uh, for the robot to zoom in into that right uh, so uh currently the robot i mean uh, the idea is for the doctor to identify the marks only from the camera images that um, that are relayed to uh, the doctor's uh, iPad or um, tablet. And uh, based on that, uh, the doctor would identify, okay, maybe there is a wound there, uh, but the patient probably cannot move uh, or um, zoom or, or show the, uh, the wound to the camera. So the, uh, the soft part of the robot would uh, deform, zoom in, and go close to the wound 
So that's uh, actually our first uh, kind of task in terms of um, making this uh, applicable for uh, the order adopt setting. Yes. Oh, no, I mean, I or I can repeat it either way. You can come up. Okay. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, this is Carolyn uh, Phillips. And uh, when I'm listening to the presentations, I'm definitely looking at it from that lens of um, how do we get this knowledge out there? So I'm thinking about training. Uh, and that's very much what I'm hearing from you, Meryl. Definitely, you know, I'm with you, as you know, my friend. And then also Beth. Um, so I'm wondering what y'all's thoughts are about how we transfer this information, you know, whether it's the, the health equity, the disability studies, the, even the basic disability 101, but even as we were talking about accessibility, you know, how do we transfer that um, in a way that could build capacity, but also grow exponentially? That's what I would love to see. Okay, so the question was for Beth and Meryl about how do we train how do we train how do we educate the general public and providers um to and researchers, and researchers to um deal with some of these issues in terms of inequities and just in disability um understanding the research that's going on the findings that are happening and um those messages that that you're sharing with us and even the accessibility piece like you know, plain language, but also easy to read. And okay. So, and also, yes, how to better educate and train people about uh, making sure that services and resources are accessible. So I know Beth is in and out. So I'm gonna see if she is available right now. Okay, so we'll start with you, Meryl. Okay, <laughs> I can stop talking when Beth comes back. That's fine. Um, no. Um, Carolyn, I wish I could see you. I'm super jealous uh, that you're there and I'm not. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there are a couple of things and I think it's going to take years, like, which is, is sad, but it, it just will. But, you know, we need to start teaching some of this in medical schools, right? I, I think if we're not in medical schools and helping, you know, providers to see, I mean, other than that, once a, a provider is, I'll say out, right, you know, ha, has a degree and is out practicing, we're retro training versus, and they've already, you know, given what we may call misinformation to parents, you know, and, and if they don't know that options exist in community and that there are ways to access waivers and that health plans rate endorse this and there are opportunities other than ABA if somebody chooses not, you know, um, to elect um, having ABA services. So I think, you know, we have to start there, but then we have to put the effort in, you know, um, now even as health plans, you know, we have really strong, robust um, training platforms and curriculums so that people can get, you know, um, credit, uh, CEs and CMEs and, and everything else is where we're all trying to get to so that people will take the trainings. But the other thing is getting people with disabilities in front of um, providers and researchers and professionals and getting people with disabilities embedded in clinical trials and all the places, right, that people with disabilities need to be so that we're getting the word out. But we have to do, and it's what you and I are going to have to start talking about even around our, you know, our, our health literacy stuff is we have to, it's, it's going to be a roadshow, um, both virtually and physically, but we have to get out there and, and get in front of people um, to do that. And we need, we need ambassadors, that are gonna say that are gonna to go to the AMA and they're gonna to talk to their peers and they're gonna to talk to family physicians. They're gonna talk, you know, to mental health and substance use disorder. Um, I mean, so we need, we need that level of ambassadorship, I think as well um, to promote this, but we, we do need to be pretty intentional about it. I don't have all the answers today. Um, just a couple of loose ideas uh, to help a different, you know, a greater conversation. Thank you, Meryl. I think those are really great comments and also just made me think about Al's comment about, you know, getting people at the table um, and thinking about telehealth. Well, we need to make sure telehealth is accessible in order to be able to get those people at the table. Yes, we have another question. Yeah, I have a question. It's, it's about the robot will think. It's kind of related to that. Maybe it's too specific to be way too far down the line. But hey, do you mind this problem? Yeah, that might be easier than say, oh, yeah. All right. Sorry. Thank you. Well, or you could stand over. Or stand over here so you don't click. Well, yeah, you can pick up. This is the mic right here. Yeah. All right. 
Thank you. Um, and I'll just speak to you directly. Um, yeah, so just, I, I guess Beth had me thinking about this. So the robot and the accessibility of telehealth, I mean, it, the research is amazing and the use case is amazing, but how the physicians would use it, yes, but then how would, realistically, who would have one of these and how would you roll it out? And I'm just curious how you're developing it with that in mind, scalability and all the inequalities that research leads to. There's an inequality of, I can see a huge, won't be accessible to people, the uptake, you know, be a loan program, but if you had a rural hospital, I'm just kind of curious if you're thinking about that as you're developing it or if your technology, and that's well, kind of a loaded question. <laughs> I mean, I mean, question. these are uh, really uh, useful points and I, I think we should be thinking about it as we are designing. So that, that's my whole perspective of core design, uh, but, uh, but you're right. Uh, our initial focus is to demonstrate this technology uh, to ensure that uh, I mean something like this could be really useful, um, both for all of us as well as um, uh, the, the healthcare professionals. Um, but then, uh, in terms of accessibility, uh, I think um, there is one other advantage of the kind of robots. I mean, I, I'm, I'm speaking specifically to the kind of robots that we are building. Uh, some of these soft robots are extensively easy to build. Uh, they do not cost as much. Uh, so bringing down the cost barriers, I think, is, uh, is essential. But otherwise, uh, if, if you look at any other uh, robot, uh, even a rigid robot, which is deemed safe enough to interact within the perimeters of the human, um, they would require a lot of sensors. Uh, there would be a lot of inbuilt controls. And all of these have to work together. It increases the cost. So uh, I think getting the cost of uh, the design uh, low uh, is, uh, I think, what uh, motivates me and my group uh, in terms of uh, uh, taking this ahead. But yes, I agree that uh, we need to think about accessibility. Uh, and it's not just the robot, it's also about the connections, uh, the Wi-Fi, the, um, uh, the, the latency involved in terms of uh, when uh, the uh, healthcare professional uh, clicks a target and by the time the robot eventually gets to it, uh, that latency there are lots of underlying issues there when you uh, want to add yes. something yes, yes. and your partner up here just to add something i just want to talk about the osf healthcare that we're partnering with because they particularly support rural um patients and so one idea is to think about how we can drop off one of these robots at your home for six weeks while you're after you've been released from a hospital, you can use it and then we move it on to the next person. And so the healthcare system would pay for it and it would be available to more people that way. That's one of the things, one of the benefits of having the OSF Health as one of our core partners on the project. So John, do you wanna come up here too? And I, I think that's much more efficient. If, if you don't mind. No, actually, they couldn't pick you up last night, so I'm gonna have you walk away. <laughs> so just to follow up on that, and so is the intent then really for it to be a, you know, a post discharge sort of short term and not necessarily a longer term monitoring of chronic conditions? I think initially, if we think of where would you first be able to implement these robots, that's the first place where you right. could do it affordably and effectively, and then it could grow from there as we get scale and price. And then, I mean, I think that, you know, like I said before, it's like the, the, the flexibility is great, but one of the problems even with short term is where is this going to go, right? So you're in a, you're in a rural house with a, a eight by 10 bedroom. Where's the robot going to go? Where is we'll it going to that part out? We'll yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, to, you know, it's one of those things as, you know, as it gets on in part of cost is bringing it down in size, even for a flexible robot. So the other part that I missed was uh, manipulation. So if it's able to manipulate and it's able to pick in place and uh, even help uh, the older adult uh, around, maybe even to clean the place or even uh, uh, pick medication and hand it over. So then it could be a long-term use. It need not be just a post-discharge. It could be the monster under the bed. Yes, right? it could be the monster under the bed. Or hides under there and comes out from under the bed. Or from the seal. <laughs> <laughs> we have one question online and then I'm going to go to uh, Carolyn. So Margaret, um, can you please unmute and we'll see if we can hear you okay?
let's see. One second, Margaret. I can't quite hear you yet. Um, yeah, we might need to have you type your question in the chat if. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Margaret. We can't hear you, and I. It looks like you're unmuted. So. Just oh now she's mute. now you're not muted but we can't hear you. So, sorry, so I might ask you to just type in the chat. But we can hear us. Yeah. Let's see if she's going to be able to type in the chat. Let's see. Yeah, it's not showing up yet. Okay. Sorry, Margaret. I'm going to take Carolyn's question. We'll try to see if there's anything else we can do, or you can work on typing it in. So my question actually just, it builds on your question um, about the accessibility of the interface. Um, I'm very excited about what y'all are building and I can see all kinds of potential um, as a mom of somebody who would totally benefit from this uh, and would have benefited from it during COVID. Um, but I'm wondering about the interface and making sure that, that, that it is accessible, but then also the training components and even the way that it's, um, like you said, the monster underneath the bed, and we were back there going, "Oh gosh, opt you know, it did look like an octopus, didn't it?" <laughs> and so, um, so thinking about having, uh, you know, um, the accessibility, but also the inclusion of folks throughout the whole process. And I know y'all are committed. I know you're doing that, but I'm wondering about that interface and the training piece to it and all right. that. Uh, I mean, I think that this is going to be a significant amount of. Uh, Both healthcare professionals as well as both the health and just to do some kind of a, an in-person training as well, where um, uh, they, they are given some kind of an orientation about how uh, this robot is uh, uh, is going to perform. And uh, uh, I mean, at one point we were even thinking about uh, okay, if uh, the wound needs to be monitored in an autonomous fashion, uh, like repeatedly every five hours or something like that, the robot itself could go to that position and then monitor uh, the wound without the healthcare professional even. Uh, being there, um, uh, but then they could get a series of images next time they see, um, okay, this was taken yesterday, this was taken five, uh, five hours after, uh, et cetera. So uh, th th there is uh, going to be a significant orientation and training apart from that. Uh, I know, really, well, I was just going to, um, we mentioned at the beginning, this is a small project. We've just started. Right. It's okay. very exciting. So we've submitted an NSF proposal to do some of the development work. But then one of the reasons I invited Garish today was to think about what are some of the unique needs of disability population that we should also be trying to explore perhaps through neither funding. Yes. So that's, this is a great discussion. It's really right, helpful. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, I, I can, I'm in several support groups with folks. I can't tell you how many uh, adults with um, that are friends of mine that have autism um, that have not been to a doctor in 10 years because it's so scary to them. But having something like this, um, my mom who had Huntington's disease, mild cognitive impairment, a lot of other folks, you know, experience that. Um, but Huntington's is what she had. But we could, it was so expensive. It cost us $500 to get her to the doctor because we had to rent an ambulance and we had to do right. all kinds of things. Right. So, yeah. So the, I, I, this is great. So let's figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, that's a very important point because I think it came up even during the older adult uh, as well. It's about uh, how easy it would be without uh, transportation, you know, just having access to this uh, right now. Right? So, uh, so I don't think I Okay. Sorry. I'll still read the question, I think maybe we can all discuss. Um, so thank you, Margaret. Margaret Campbell had a question and it is directed to Beth's presentation and her excellent critique of the limitations of our current research paradigms and the wider, deeper lens that we need to integrate these perspectives to avoid reinforcing negative stereotypes. And my question is, 
how do we start building and testing the more integrated research models and methods to generate the quality of evidence we need? Great question. Yep, anybody can answer. Oh, well, it, it is specifically um, addressing Beth's presentation. I think it's a great question to, to really think about and, and end our question session on. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I think I really appreciate that thoughtfulness. So. Ask the question, none of the rest. That only answer. maybe Margaret can answer. <laughs> I, 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 I said I would pinch it for Beth. She had a meeting with her provost and she had to step out. But Margaret, I can answer that question, but maybe what you can think about it can help us answer it as we think about it. Yeah. Great thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, I want to thank everyone for their patience as we navigate having not only hybrid um, participation, but hybrid. Uh, presentations, which we just really appreciate that everyone could be with us in one way or another. And I also want to thank Alyssa so much for her help with the technical. I like to think I'm high tech, but this is really overwhelming today. <laughs> Lots of things going on at once. Um, so just big round of applause for the all of the presenters. And, um, thank you. Just a couple of housekeeping items. I just wanted to let all of our guests online um, know that we have all of our showcase material that is about to be presented live for our in-person attendees available online. So just to clarify, there will not be an online live portion, um, but we encourage you to check out our conference homepage, scroll to the bottom. You can choose by project to see all of our great posters and videos on display. So thank you again for your time.